Welcome everyone to Video Chess Training on YouTube. This is my YouTube channel and I'm International Master William Pascal. Today we're going to take a look at a game I actually played myself at a recent tournament, the Zalakaros Open in Hungary. I'm playing black this game and my opponent is a quite strong GM, Grandmaster Viktor Erdos, or in Hungarian we would say Erdos Viktor. My first tournament back in a long time, and it's been quite a few years since I played strong players in a tournament of this format. I've been able to prepare for Erdos before the game, but there's a limited amount of time, and the question as to how much time you really want to put into preparing for an individual game. I don't like to go too crazy, maybe a few hours preparing. Some players, some players go really crazy, but uh, I think you're often up against a surprise, as we'll see in this game. It's better to have your openings worked out at home. So Victor plays d4. He had been playing a lot of c4 lately and stuff like knight f3. And I was hoping for some kind of English or knight f3 type thing. Because I've been playing that myself a lot with white. So I was kind of sad to see d4 but not surprised because I'd actually expected Erdos to play the white side of a classical Nimzo with queen c2. He knows that I play several different openings against d4, the King's Indian, and also Nimzo Indian, Bogo Indian, Queen's Indian, sometimes the Blumenfeld, sometimes some other stuff. But against stronger players, I tend to play solid setup based on Nimzo or Queen's Indian or Bogo Indian. So I expected him to play. He's kind of an expert with white in the classical Nimzo. After d4, knight f6, c4, I played e6. So this is, the idea is to play a solid setup against a strong grandmaster. Erdos is rated about 2570, but he's been higher. He's been as high as 2650 in the last several years. I think one of the most talented uh, young Hungarian grandmasters. So at this point, I'm expecting knight c3, and he played knight f3. And now, Houston, we have a problem because... Not that I don't have a variation against knight f3. I could play the queen's indian or the bogo indian or the blumenfeld for that matter. But you've got to say to yourself, okay, this guy is prepared for me. He's got to be prepared for th three possible openings there. The problem with the blumenfeld, like c5, it's a very aggressive setup. He could be pre pretty prepared for the line I play in that. The queen's indian, it's just extremely popular, extremely well known. So I thought I'd take my chances here with bishop b4. Bishop b4, check. The problem is I didn't know what he plays, and he's prepared for this and I'm not. There's nothing you can really do. Sometimes you just have to go into the opponent's first surprise and see what you can do. So here I'm hoping for bishop d2, because I know those variations a little better than knight bd2. But of course he plays knight on bd2. Now in retrospect, I, I've seen that he has played this on occasion before. Being a player who played most of his career knight c3 instead of knight f3, Erdos uh, doesn't have very many games. I didn't see any Bogo Indian games when I was preparing, but I didn't go back like very many years. Now, it turns out um, he had a white side of a Bogo knight bd2 as recently as 2013 against a very strong theoretician, Mihai Marin. And Marin played the same line that I played. Now, here I'll explain. I normally play d5 in this position. But I felt that Victor was prepared for that because that's the line that I've played in the past in multiple games. Um, so I thought that here, what I want to do is try to surprise him. But I made a bad practical decision in my choice. The main moves for black are like b6 at this point, knight on b to d2, b6, or alternatively d5, which is a move that I play myself. And castles as in the game. The problem is I have very limited experience. I played mostly just d5. So here on YouTube, I did a video not long ago. You might, you will want to take a look at that, guys. It's a game between Grandmaster Moisienko and Grandmaster Antipov. I did the video. I thought it was a fantastic game. And I've been fooling around with this setup for Black, but I didn't really think about like playing it in a serious game. I hadn't really studied the theory in detail, and it's kind of a risky line. So if I had to do this over again, I would play a solid move here, like b6, or just go with what I know. 
which is d5. But instead, I made a bad decision. I played castles, which is okay, but after a3, against a strong player here, I really need to play bishop takes d2 check. Because we are, we are playing black, we have less space, and we really want to get a solid position, and maybe we're not afraid to trade pieces. It's not a weaker player where we must play for a win with black. So I think this is a very bad practical decision by me to play this variation, which is very risky, bishop e7, and one that I don't know really well. I have a limited amount of practice playing kind of fast games online with this variation. You can also check some of my live chess streams here that I've done. Um, maybe you'll find some games with, with this variation, but I don't know the theory all that well. Victor here, well, you can play quietly with a move like e3, but Victor here plays the critical move e4. And now, I think that you have to play d6 in this position. It looks very, and it is very passive for black. And to the uninitiated, it may just look plain stupid. You know, like white has this massive center, c4, d4, and e4, and black has just d6 and e6, like some kind of weird old Indian. But the whole thing has a kind of positional basis. White's knight is badly placed at d2. It's getting in the way of the bishop on c1. It doesn't really have a good square to go to. So it's causing problems with coordination in white's position. And that's the basic idea. In the King's Indian, where black has a structure similar to this with g6, usually the knight's always on, on c3, and it doesn't get in the way there for white. So there are all these weird possibilities of white playing something like e5. It doesn't really work very well. White ends up getting like overextended if he plays e5. So the setup itself is, is viable for black. But you really have to know what you're doing because white has, obviously, a significant space advantage. Now, one option for white here, which I haven't really seen, but I would think is reasonable, would be b4. I don't really see anything wrong with this move, grabbing space and deterring black from certain plans, like maybe c5, knight c6, and preparing the fianchetto. Strangely, in this position after d6, White has really limited himself to three moves. Bishop d3, bishop e2, and queen c2. And Erdos chose the latter here, queen c2. So the move order in the game that I annotated confused me a little bit, I think. Because when I went over the game with Antipov, playing black against Moisienko from Aeroflot here on the YouTube channel, I believe that, that Moisienko played bishop e2, e2 first. So I got a little confused when I was playing Erdos. I wasn't really sure how the move order was in that game. And it just goes to show you have to do your homework before you try something out in a, in a tournament game against a strong player. I should play a5 here. This this may actually be a somewhat new move. The game uh, Moisienko versus Anapov went bishop e2 a5 to stop b4. But once again, we could ask ourselves the question, why not white just play b4 in the first place? And I don't really have a good answer. Maybe that's a better move. Black could play e5. In that case, perhaps, if we step back a second here and just take a look you know, at, at what would happen if white played b4, there is the possibility of playing e5. And then pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, knight takes e5, queen d4. You see, we win a piece here. But maybe that's not the end of the world. I mean, maybe white could just close the center with something like d5, or maybe white could just play bishop b2, keeping tension in the center. That's perhaps why people have been hesitant to play b4. So anyway, queen c2, and now in those variations, if that was to occur later on, he might have something like bishop b2, defending the rook on a1, defending the knight on e5. So that's all right. That's why white maybe doesn't play for example, b4. Here I need to play a5. There is no question in my mind. And I could probably transpose to a game that Gelfand played against Antipov 2015, bishop e2. Generally speaking, the bishop looks more active on d3, but it's better on e2. It's less vulnerable there. It also attacks h5, maybe discouraging black. But if we play bishop e2 here, a5, bishop e2, we transpose to... Uh, to the Moisienko Antipov game after knight c6, when Moisienko played b3 and Antipov played a very interesting move, knight h5, heading for f4. And just to recap that again, Moisienko let the knight into f4, and I think that was a very serious mistake. 
if this position was to occur again, at this point, g3 is white's best move. And I still think that white is better here, although the position is very interesting after, say, e5. For example, e5, d5, knight b8. Black is preparing to play f5. And it's not as easy as it might look for for white to exploit the uh, the position of, of the knight on h5. There are complicated moves, like knight takes e5 might be a problem in some positions. So black has to be a little bit careful. I was a little bit unsure over the board about whether we could allow tricks like, like this, for example. So it has to be calculated carefully with a knight h5. But there's no doubt that white should play g3 in that kind of situation, probably critical position. Anyway, a little bit of background here. Um, this Anapov idea of playing knight c6, it's a very, very kind of new sort of thing. Most of the players in these positions have in the past played something like knight bd7, or alternatively even knight on fd7, with the idea of, of e5, like a strong point, knight fd7, and then later something like bishop e2 e5 this this has been fairly common or knight bd7 and e5 but the anapov plan is a little more active the problem is the knight on, on c6 can actually get kicked back to b8 with tempo that's what happened to me in the game so queen c2 i play knight c6 now and erdos should play b4 here but first he hesitated he played bishop e2 giving me a chance to actually transpose to the the Gelfand um, Anapov game a5 now if I play a5 here there's two approaches for white I mean white could just ignore it and play castles that's how Gelfand played he just ignored a5 let Anapov play a4 the other possibility is what Moisienko did which was b3 when black doesn't intend to play just simply e5 because if e5 d5 and we can't play knight d4 because our pawn will be very weak on d4, probably be lost. So we have to play something like knight b8 and white gains time, similar to the game that I'm going to show you now. But Anapov again played very interesting creative chess to b3, knight h5 with the idea of knight f4. But it's important that we, we have the inclusion of, of b3. I mean, that I think weakens white's position and sort of somewhat justifies this, this idea of knight h5. So, in my game, I didn't play a5, and after knight c6, white could have played b4, but he played instead bishop b2. And there, I must play a5 here. But over the over the board, I started to have some kind of strange paranoia that, um, like, I would play a5, and maybe white would play d5, and somehow get an advantage. But the truth is, it's not that clear. I mean, a5, d5, knight e5. And actually, if white takes on e5, we get a good square for our bishop on c5. Um, it's not that clear. White could play something like knight to d4. We could play knight back to g6. We threaten to play knight f4. And white is a little better, but it's not that easy for white. And a5 turns out to be a fairly useful move for black. So, a very serious mistake here. Omitting a5, I played a waiting move in this position, and I had a kind of hallucination. So this is a terrible novelty, I guess, in this position. Rook e8, very, very bad move, and I end up losing all sorts of time. I had a kind of hallucination here. For some reason, I was trying to line up threats along the e-file to, to allow me to play knight d4. I thought that somehow I could set up a tactical way of setting up knight to d4, but it doesn't work. After rook e8, b4, I play e5, and I realize that I simply have to retreat my knight back to b8. So my whole position is is nearly bankrupt at this point. I, I felt very, very angry with myself for you know omitting a5. Anyway, Erdos plays perfectly d5, and now if I play knight to d4, it doesn't look like I have very much compensation. Knight takes d4, pawn takes d4, pawn takes d4. And over the board I had some kind of hallucination that I could play c5 in this position and everything would be okay, but it just doesn't work. Obviously, c5, he takes on en passant and takes c5 and bishop takes d4. And it's possible that black has some sort of compensation after a5, but it doesn't really look, it doesn't really look very realistic. Castles and white is just a pawn up. So 
We had a very, very bad hallucination. I thought the rook on e8 would allow me to play knight d4, but it doesn't work. I have to go back with knight b8. And it's not hopeless, though. We, we actually learn a lot from this game. Castles. And now, this is a really interesting moment. If you put this on an engine, and I guess most humans would probably play a developing move here with bishop g4. And that move's okay. It's maybe the best move. But the problem is white is preparing to play c5 in this position after castles. Um, white is preparing to play c5. And he's going to have pressure along the C file here. So I would think that our best bet was guarding C7. So I lost more time. And it just goes to show that you can afford to lose some time. Castles and now Rook F8. And it's very strange. I played Knight C6 and Knight back to B8. I played E6 and then E5. I've played bishop b4 and then bishop back to e7. And now I've played rook e8 and I've played rook f8. And still my position is tenable. Bishop to b2 and knight e8. And there's somewhere in chess literature I read that the starting position is not that weak. And now we play knight e8. It's a Steinitzian kind of retreat. First of all, we may be able to develop the bishop actively with bishop g5, trade off a bad piece there. That's something that I could consider maybe even right away. Erdush, of course, doesn't waste time. He plays c5 here. He's a very, very, very strong positional player. Um, now, I could consider bishop g5, but tactically it doesn't work. White is threatening to break through along the c5 at this point. So what we need to do is keep the bishop on c8 protected. And the point of knight e8 was really that it would guard c7, guard d6. So we strike back, counterplay, King's Indian style, f5. White has gained quite a few tempi here. But it's interesting to show that if you don't create weaknesses in your position, even a 2600 Grandmaster, I think that it's safe to say the victor is, is he's a little bit uh, out of form now. But he is a 2600 GM, and on average, even though he, he may have dropped a little bit below. But he's extremely solid. He, he almost never loses a single game. And... Um, this kind of position goes to show if, if you can hold the line against a strong player like this, the initial position is not too weak. Rook on A to C1, and now we we don't really know what to do. There's no time to play a closed move like F4 and attack on the king side. White's breaking through, so we have to keep him busy. And I'm not really happy about this. F takes E4, giving him a good outpost square. But something just happened here with the pawn structure. F takes E4, knight takes E4. And now the pawn structure is still technically roughly level but i have a, a bigger pawn island e5 through a7 we have broken toward the center we traded in an f pawn toward the center for the pawn on e4 so as far behind as i am in development um, something positive has happened for me here in terms of dynamics of the pawn structure so he's got a good square for his knight in e4 but suddenly his pawn on d5 starts to look kind of vulnerable i mean if d takes c, b takes c, queen takes d5, he has bishop c4. It's not a question of me winning this pawn right now. But later on down the line, this pawn on d5 could be a weakness, you'll see. So I need to develop the bishop on c8, bishop f5. And now white doesn't mess around. Very strong move, bishop d3. And here I had a choice between two moves. Because he's threatening very nasty things like knight f6 check. If nothing else, he can just get a powerful white squared bishop powerful unopposed white squared bishop and there are also tactical shots like knight takes d6 or sometimes knight g5 depending on the position so i really have to do something about the bishop kind of hanging on f5 and i played king h8 which is okay but i think it was worth considering instead playing bishop g6 here this this move allowing me to open the f file for my pieces i think he would have done the same thing as in the game i mean it's very possible the game would have actually transposed after knight g3, bishop takes d3. But there's a chance he might have done something different. So he played this one, bishop f5, bishop d3, now king h8, and knight g3. And Erdos understands in this king's Indian type position how important the e4 square is, but also how the king's Indian bishop, this uh, the white square bishop for black in the king's Indian, is, is my good bishop because I have pawns on dark squares, c7, d6, e5, 
he's trading off my good bishop and I'm left with a bad bishop. It's not really a King's Indian, but the structure is similar to that of King's Indian, except I haven't played I haven't played G6. It's more like an old Indian, if you will. Um, knight G3, bishop takes D3. I'm not really happy with my position, but nothing really bad has happened yet. I managed to trade some pieces, but on the positive side, this pawn on D5 is looking like it could potentially become a weakness. So queen takes D3. I finally get to develop and just in time, because white really was threatening, maybe stuff like queen b5. And my weakness is the weakness on b7. You know, I, I might consider a6 at some point. But any any pawn you touch could create, you know, concurrent weaknesses. So I'd prefer to play knight d7. If you play something like c6, I'm going to take it. And my c7 pawn is pretty solid. So knight d7, then knight e4. And at this point, he's threatening many times to play knight to g5. He's also threatening maybe to play c6 at some point. So here, I wanted a good square for my knight on d7, where you know I'm not going to f6 and allowing him to play knight g5, which would just positionally crush black. So what I did was I found a kind of strange way of freeing the f8 square. I could just simply play something like h6 here. Maybe that's the best, I don't know. But it's very passive. So we played rook f4. And we should really look to white here. You know, I, I didn't play a great game. It was an interesting game. But Erdos played, I thought, extremely well. The following move, exceptional move, rook c4. I mean, this is a multi-purpose move to the next level. He's preparing to double on the c file. He's reinforcing his knight on e4. He has tactical shots laterally against my rook on f4. But most importantly is the subtle little point that came up in the game, that he's actually freeing c1 for his bishop. The whole thing about the position, there are sacrifices on e5, but what's really cool is that, um, you know, when you play bishop b2 in this kind of structure, you're not that happy because unless you have some kind of sacrifice on e5, I think that the bishop is a little bit dead. It's biting on that pawn on e5. So it turns out that his bishop's actually better on c1. So I did what I wanted to do. I got to play knight f8, which gets my knight out of the way of my other pieces. But Victor also got to do what he wanted to do, which was to centralize his bishop on e3, where it helps defend and also attack a7. It gets out of the way and uh, gets to an active central position. So I thought this was an excellent plan. Rook c4 and bishop c1. And now I could play rook f5. It's a very strange move uh, noted by the computer. I think I saw it over the board. But um, rook f7 looks safer. And now white could get an advantage by playing knight g5. But I didn't see anything concrete for white. After knight to g5, bishop takes g5. Um, knight takes g5. It looks really scary for black. Rook e7. I think he has f4 in this position with a very, very powerful attack. But I didn't really see any alternatives. It looks like this this may be white's best. But I think that Victor was afraid uh, he would trade off one of my bad pieces and, and maybe I would escape somehow. But I think this was concretely his best. Probably this very sharp line with knight g5 and f4 opening the game. All of his pieces really, really coming in. It looks like clear advantage to white. Almost winning. Maybe it's winning, but probably not a forced win. It's going to take some moves here. White's going to have to continue to, to improve the position. I was worried about this, but there was very little I could do. Rook f7, um, bishop e3. So he's getting in time pressure now, which he's apt to do. And I saw the threat, so h6 now. Not a move I really wanted to play. It weakens the white squares. I have no white square bishop, but I decided that I could afford it. Just barely afford this weakness. And um, give myself a square for the knight at h7. And I'm going to play like queen d7 and probably creep creep away here. And it worked out. And I think that black was creeping away. Bishop e3, um, h6, rook fc1. Now he has very natural king's indian type of play along the c file. But black is solid. It's surprising. Knight h7. And we start threats of maybe knight g5, maybe knight f6. If I can trade pieces, trade enough pieces here, we could end up in a situation where white actually has a worse structure. If he opens the file, he's going to end up with an isolated pawn on d5. So he starts to be cautious now. I play knight h7, he plays knight on f to d2. 
This isn't a move that he played because he's afraid of an exchange sacrifice on f3. I mean, that could happen if I was better developed, but here it's not really a threat. He's simply overprotecting the e4 square and, and creating possibilities for himself, I think, avoiding exchanges of pieces. Knight on h to f6. Now, I'm trying to trade pieces, which is what you should do when you're cramped. And then Victor, of course, knight c3 here. This is a very, very strong move, avoiding the exchange of pieces. And also, he had to watch his d5 pawn. I was threatening to play d takes c5. So this is this is starting to become a problem. He's starting to actually get tied down to the d5 pawn. Knight c3, now I'm also getting in time pressure here, but I'm not sure what I can do. So I kind of repeat position knight h7, and Victor plays knight f3. I'm not really sure about this move, but he was afraid of me trading pieces. I'm threatening to play bishop to g5, and so that would trade bad bishop for for a pretty good bishop on e3. But most importantly, relieve the cramp in my position. Bishop g5 is a huge positional threat. So Victor plays knight f3, and now I have to be very careful. I'd like to play knight g5, but he has nasty threats based on knight h4. So at this point, I decided it's time to trade my worst piece with bishop g5. It's slightly risky because he is going to get a situation, as in the game, where he has a bishop against a knight in a semi-open position. It's semi-open. Bishop g5, c takes d6, c takes d6. So it's paid off. He finally has an isolated pawn on d5. But at the moment, you can see, I don't have any pressure on that pawn. So it's just kind of hoping that I can get some pressure on d5 later on. Knight takes g5. And now knight takes g5. And this is a situation where Victor started to get into very bad very bad time pressure. He has 30 second increments every move, but he's down to about one minute of his initial time, and he's been unable to make any kind of concrete progress. So knight takes g5 now, queen c2, queen g6 was an interesting move, but I didn't really see you know a way for him to make concrete progress after that. So he decided to play it safe in time pressure with queen c2, and also, my, my knight on g5 is awkwardly placed now. So I bring it back, knight to h7, and now the critical moment in the game. King's Indian, c-file, triple, heavy pieces, and knight b5. And I had been seriously considering playing a6 last move, by the way, if, if we want to take a look at that for a second. So I was very, very seriously considering playing a6, but I'm glad that I didn't because I checked with the computer and I knew the knight on g5 could get captured, my structure shattered in some inconvenient moment. But the main fear of mine was that knight a4 would be a problem. And when I checked this with the computer, it was true. After knight a4, if I play b5, he has rook c8. And this ending is really, really, really bad for black. Having played a6 and b5 weakens my pawns on the queen side very, very badly. So it was the right decision not to weaken it yet with a6. I played knight h7. And as we're both drifting in time pressure, knight b5, a6, basically forced, and now he's in very, very bad time pressure, plays rook c8, maybe the best move there. And now I have to trade rooks, rook takes c8, I could take with the queen as well. And here's where I missed my, my only really good chance to save the game here. After rook takes c8, queen takes c8, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I can simply trade queens. And I'm not sure white is winning this position. It was a very, very bad oversight on my part that I didn't see that I can play queen takes c8, rook takes c8, because I thought here I'm just like lost. But I forgot that I could play rook, rook f8 because my rook is protected by the knight on h7. And after rook f8, it's, it's not clear that white's winning. I mean, white's still better, but he has no way to make progress directly. He has to actually retreat with knight to c3. And I think that after knight to c3, Black is basically black is basically hanging on. I play knight on h to f6, and maybe bring my king up to h7, g6 toward the center. Later on, I could play rook f7 or something like that. It's a little bit unpleasant for black, but looking at it with the engine, um, several moves ahead, it doesn't really look obvious that that white can win. Maybe b5 here for white is the best try. When I could find, I found one variation where white had a better like rook against knight rook and knight versus rook and knight ending 
with the past a pawn but it's it's kind of tricky and i think it's a shame that i didn't play this move because this was a really really good chance to save the game after rook c8 rook takes c8 um so queen takes c8 and i played rook d7 i didn't see another option here for black really and it looks like here black is okay except for one problem he finds this with his flag hanging which is the only move to keep the advantage, bishop b6. Very, very strong move, and if I take, I get mated, or I'll least, like, lose all my pieces. Um, if I don't get mated, I just lose the queen to knight on e8 and rook on d7. So, very unpleasant move. I saw it, but I was like, well, maybe he won't see it with his flag hanging, but he did. Now, queen e7 is forced. Although, this ending, I said forced, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe this ending also, queen takes c8, rook takes c8, is tenable uh, for black, but it's very unpleasant now. After knight f6, knight e7, rook e7, um, this, this end game looks legitimately difficult. Looks legitimately difficult to me for black, but still a, a reasonable chance, some small chance to survive here. I'm not down any material. And white is better, but I wouldn't say black is necessarily lost here. So anyway, after bishop b6, queen e7, uh, victor here with, with no time, just increments on the clock. 30 seconds per move. Okay, it's it's enough. Um, knight c7, and now I have to play knight f6, and he simply eats this pawn on b7, walking into a pin. I mean, it looks awkward, but <laughs> I don't know. And here I had to play king h7, but at this point, I was also freaking out because I was actually down to one second when I made this move, trying to find something here for black. Uh, the best move was king h7 just maintaining the pin but I think that white is white is probably winning after something like Queen c8 white has a very very strong advantage so it's it's probably close to lost now for black but the text move loses for sure although he does give me a chance here Knight takes d5 Queen takes d5 also possible for for Victor was Knight takes d5 this, this ending is also good Knight takes d5 Rook takes b7 Knight takes e7 Rook takes, and then Rook c6, with a good bishop against bad knight, and a very weak pawn, and White has the queenside majority. So this looks looks like it's going to be pretty pretty difficult for Black to hold on. Um, the text move though, his flag was hanging, as was mine. Um, he just made a decision. Queen takes d5, and then Knight takes c7, Queen d3, both of us in very bad time pressure, and then e4, probably best move. And here I'm not sure what he should have played. Uh, which square? Maybe e3 for the queen or something? I can't recall, but after queen b3, after the game, Victor was very concerned that here I could have saved the game with d5. This is, um, this is move 37, 38. I played badly here with 96. I didn't see I could play d5. d5, pushing the pawn forward and uh, defending because... He has a back rank problem. If he trades twice on c7, um, he takes on d5, he gets mated on the back rank. So he can't win the pawn. But he still has a strong bishop and outside pass pawn and control of the c-file. So after something like queen g3, black would have to be very, 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 very careful here um, not to lose this game. And probably something like knight e8. We have to be extremely, extremely accurate and careful. Um, maybe black could hold on here. So I had some chances. But after queen b3, knight e6, this is probably lost because I no longer have d5. I've kind of like overextended my e4 pawn. He has control of the open file. He has a better minor piece. Although I could have some tricks with a knight and queen. Um, he has separated my pawns. a6 looks weak. e4 looks weak. My king side is a little bit weak. And his, his king is perfectly safe. He just needs to play something like h3. So knight e6, queen d5 masterful positional game from Victor Erdos, and I basically thought I was lost here, although I hadn't yielded any material yet. Um, knight to g5, it's an awful square for the knight, but I had to defend e4, and I'm lucky I don't get mated directly. This is time control now, rook c8, check, king h7. We had 30 minutes more, but black is very, very close to getting mated by force. Queen f5, check, g6, only move, and then queen d5, and here, I have no idea what I should do. Um, it's probably lost, but practically I still have a chance. 
I played knight f7 here, but I don't know what black can do. Um, knight f7, and then uh, Grandmaster um, Smith here pointed out that, Brian Smith pointed out, maybe h4 is is the best move for, for black. It's kind of funny. But after knight f7, Victor simply played h3. This is good enough. In fact, he doesn't even have to do that. I mean, he could play bishop d4. He doesn't even have to worry about it. But um, after h3, I have only one move here not to lose immediately, which is queen e5. But I don't believe that black has realistic chances to survive this. If queen e5, queen takes e5, knight takes e5, my a6 pawn is, is very, very weak. I mean, I don't believe that this ending is uh, really tenable for black. With the outside pawn, the bishop and outside pawn, Black should probably be winning. But I blundered here after h3 with rook b7. I didn't want to trade queens because I thought the ending would be hopeless, which it probably is. But I didn't realize that I had to trade queens because I'm getting mated. Rook b7 and then bishop d4. And my hallucination was that I resigned here when I realized what was going on. But my hallucination was that I could make some kind of neutral move here, but not seeing that he's threatening queen takes f7 check. And queen takes f7, rook h8 mate. So, and he's also mating me after knight e5. It's funny. I thought, oh, well, at least I can play knight e5 and play a few more moves. No, that's mate. Well, at least I can play um, some kind of move like rook b5. But no, that's mate. Queen takes f7. So, black just has to resign here. But you can see that everything that's gone wrong. White has a powerful minor piece. White has the better pawn structure. White has outside pawn. He has control of the file. So, all these advantages were just accumulated. He has safer king. It's a brilliant game by white. But kind of tragic that I missed rook f8 because trading queens in rook f8 and maybe black could have held the ending. But anyway, I thought this is a very instructive game. As, as many mistakes as I made in this game, I think that we can learn a lot from examining our losses. And this, this battle from round 8 in the Zalakarosh Open is no exception to that. Thanks for joining me here at Video Chess Training on YouTube. I'm International Master William Pascal. Again, this was Pascal Black against Erdos Victor, and Victor was the victor as usual. Thanks again, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Bye-bye.